Scott. Hello. Morning. Good morning. Oh, lots of people. Yeah. Morning, Mark. <laughs> Morning. Hi. Okay, Chair, we're ready to begin at nine o'clock. So at nine o'clock, you can begin. Okay, sounds good. Thanks.
Okay, I think it's nine o'clock. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and hereby call the meeting of the reapportionment commission to order. Uh, it's 9 a.m. on July 20th, 2021. This meeting is being conducted by video conference uh, and by telephone. So uh, Mr. Secretary, can you please take the roll? Chair Mukwishi. Here. Commissioner Chip Chase. Present. Commissioner Chun. Here. Commissioner Kennedy. Here. Commissioner Nakota. Here. Commissioner Nishimura. Commissioner Nonaka. Present. Commissioner Ono. Commissioner Rathbun. Okay, I see Commissioner Rathbun. He seems to be on mute. Chair, you have a quorum. Oh, present. Thanks, Mr. Secretary. So if any of the other uh, commissioners join later, just let us know, please. And then, uh, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and <clears throat> read the uh, housekeeping items in the beginning uh, here. So pursuant to the governor's 21st proclamation related to COVID-19 emergency dated June 7th, 2021, the reapportionment commission will be meeting remotely using video and audio technology. This meeting is being recorded and will serve as the official record. The video will be posted on the Office of Elections website at elections.hawaii.gov shortly after the conclusion of this meeting. As a reminder to the public, your microphone will be muted until you are called upon. We are now going to move on to public testimony. In public testimony, as technical issues may arise, um, we are going to give the testifier a few minutes to try and resolve any connection issues. However, if the issues cannot be resolved, we will move on to the next testifier. If you would like to testify, please click raise hand under the reactions on Zoom. If you are joining us by phone, please press star nine. When recognized by the secretary, please unmute your microphone before speaking. You may also turn on your video at this time. For the record, please state your first and last name and the items that you will be testifying on. For those testifiers joining by phone, we will not have your name and we will be identifying you by the last four digits of your phone number. During public testimony, the commissioners will also be muted but they may unmute themselves to ask any questions. Okay, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Mr. Secretary, please announce the first testifier. Chair, before we get, begin, I'd like to note that Commissioner Nishimura and Commissioner Ono have joined the meeting. Thank you, Mahalo. The first testifier is Sandy Ma. Good morning, Chair and members of the commission. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Thank you. Um, I am Sandy Ma with Common Cause Hawaii. We submitted written testimony for the last meeting, last reapportionment commission meeting. The testimony was dated June 10th. I did not resubmit the same testimony as the testimony is pertinent to this discussion of the rules. Um, I just want to reiterate uh, that I hope with the discussion of the rules committee proposed rules uh, that the commissioners will consider uh, having uh, the rules apply to members, uh, specifically uh, referencing article four, section two of the Hawaii constitution stating that no commissioner may be a candidate in either of the first two elections under the reapportionment plan and also referencing Hawaii revised statutes uh, section 25-2B1, no district shall be drawn to unduly favor a person or a political party. Uh, with my June 10th letter, I also submitted um, rules from the Michigan Code of Conduct for the Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission and the policy manual from California Citizens Redistricting Commission, which had rules applying to the commissioners of those redistricting commissions. Um, so anyway, I thank you for um, allowing me to testify and suggesting that uh, your rules also apply to commissioners and staff as appropriate. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Sandy. And any commissioners, any questions for Sandy Ma? The next testifier is Corey Hardin. Um, good morning, uh, commissioners. Um, Corey Hardin from Hilo. I uh, want to first thank you for your service on the commission. Uh, my major concern is um, urging that you do um, public committee hearings as you've done in past years and not the permitted interaction groups. The interaction groups may follow the letter of the law, but in the long run, avoiding the public behind closed doors can lead to mistrust and delays and controversy. Um, second, I also urge that you ask legal counsel if you should postpone voting on the rules today the final draft of the rules was not posted till a day or so before this meeting. Uh, they should have been posted six days ahead and you don't want to end up with a legal challenge. Um, some other points um, on rule 12B, oral testimony should be transcribed. If not, we might eliminate records of testimony from some kapuna who come from an oral tradition and don't do mail or email but they have extensive historical and cultural knowledge. Uh, regarding rule seven, um, please add notice of meetings and materials um, filed six days in advance. Uh, again, regarding rule seven, for reconvene meetings, um, please have notice posted on the commission website as soon as possible. Um, regarding rule 11, um, please add the name of each presenter and organization, if any they represent, shall be included in meeting materials. And last, uh, Rule 14C for continued hearings, um, have notice posted as soon as possible on the Commission website. Um, but going back, my major point is, you know, please do the public committee hearings. Um, you know, the, the more the public has trust in the process, the, the better it will go. Thank you. Mahalo for your testimony, Corey. Commissioners, any questions for Corey? The next testifier is Brett Colbis. Okay, moving on, the next testifier is Bart Dane. Aloha, Chair and, and members of the commission. Um, I am actually resubmitting testimony. I submitted testimony late last time and I've reworked it for this time. Um, my concerns fall in three areas. I, you have the written testimony perhaps in front of you. One is transparency, and I'd like to echo much of what Sandy Ma said and Corey Hardin said. Uh, I think it's imperative uh, for there to be trust and to nip in the bud any possibility of distrust growing that the business of the commission be conducted as openly as possible. I think I might disagree slightly with Corey when she said that allowing the work to take place in the committees um, outside of public view may be following the letter of the law. I do not believe it does follow the letter of the law. I think it actually is in conflict with specific provisions of chapter 92.5. Um, I'm hoping that members of the commission who after at the last meeting came up, went into executive session then came out affirming that there was agreement that the permitted um, interactive groups could be allowed uh, there was no explanation giving, given behind their reasoning, or if it was, I, I missed it. And that sort of is an example, I think, of the problem. There is a need for those of us who follow these things closely to understand what the reasoning is so that we can effectively provide testimony and feedback. Uh, in particular, I would call your attention to um, chapter 92, section 5B, which says, this is a direct quote, no chance meeting permitted interaction or electronic communication shall be used to circumvent the spirit or requirements of this part to make decisions or to deliberate towards a decision on a matter over which the board has supervision control, jurisdiction or advisory power. Um, I suggest 
that outsourcing the uh, work, the initial work to the committees to come up with recommendations is um, giving them the power to, um, to deliberate towards making a decision. When they lay out the options and propose things for approval by the larger group, the letter of the law says that is a deliberation, that is part of the decision-making process and should be transparent. If you don't think that the, the work of the committee is, um, is a deliberation towards making a decision, I would be interested in hearing you say that. If you believe that there is an explicit exception under chapter 92, um, section five, that permits this this work towards making a decision uh, in a private, unpublic meeting, I wish you would cite which exception you are uh, interpreting to allow that. Um, second, I'm hoping, and I think perhaps the presentation by uh, David Rosenbrock will inform me on this, I'm hoping we get a sense of the timeline of when likely meetings and decisions and issues are going to be taken up by the commission so that we can prepare our testimony effectively. Third, and this is kind of significant, is uh, there's discussion of conflict of interest. I, I, I appreciate the comment that someone shouldn't be a candidate uh, in election cycles immediately following the work. But I think that in, in the earlier discussion as to which members should serve on what committees, there was a, a discussion that someone who lives in a district that is likely to be impacted heavily by redrawing of lines should be part of the redistricting committee precisely because they have intimate knowledge of that district. I agree with that, but there is also a downside of that, that there is the potential for conflict of interest if the person is very actively involved in political campaigns, even if it's not their own campaign. And while members are permitted to be involved in campaigns, I think it there, for the interest of building public trust, if any member has actively participate in campaigns in a district where they are going to be making recommendations about the drawing of the lines that may hurt an incumbent or potential candidate or help a potential candidate, they should disclose that information in advance if there is a conflict of interest or the appearance of conflict of interest so that other commissioners can be aware of that and consider that when they look at their recommendations and where the lines should be drawn. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity to testify. I look forward to hearing your discussion and particularly the presentation by uh, staff. Thank you. Mahalo, Bart. Any, any questions from the commissioners for, for Bart? The next testifier is Brett Colbus. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, uh, thank you for allowing the opportunity as the uh, Honolulu County representative for the Republican Party. Uh, I stand by my submission of my uh, input and uh, really, and I like Mr. Dam's comments and I totally agree, the more transparency this, this board has, the better off and more understanding the, uh, the general public will have. So uh, I would like that the uh, permitted interaction groups be, be made sure that those are public, public uh, meetings, mahalo. Mahalo, Brett. Uh, anyone, any commissioner have a question for Brett? Chair, there are no further testifiers. Thank you uh, very much, everyone who submitted testimony. Um, I feel like I wanna say something because there's a common theme about transparency throughout all of the um, testimony that we got today. And, you know, I just want to say I made a commitment early on that that I'm a transparent person and I intend to run this commission um, with the transparency that is necessary to um, to get to public trust. I, I will say, though, that the statute is written by very wise people who understand that there has to be a balance uh, between transparency and practicality to get stuff done. And, um, you know, you can't actually get stuff done if you put 1.4 million people in a room. So the, the wisdom of having permitted interaction groups is that you will allow drafts to be created um, that can be brought for public discussion in a public forum, and then in a separate meeting acted upon so that there's time for public comment and interaction. 
And we intend to follow all of those laws and the spirit of those laws as well as the letter of those laws. And uh, hopefully that will be transparent and will create trust in the public. So I, I just felt I had to say that because it is a, a common theme. Um, with that, I'm gonna move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the extension of the reapportionment deadline by, uh, by the July 7th, 2021 uh, Hawaii Supreme Court order. And this was great news for us. Um, the, um, to all the commissioners, I wanna make sure that you are aware that the Hawaii Supreme Court issued an order extending the reapportionment deadlines. Per the order, the commission must issue public notice of its legislative and congressional reapportionment plans no later than January 6th, I'm sorry, January 8th, January 8th, 2022. And then we must file our final legislative and congressional reapportionment plans with the chief election officer no later than February 27th, 2022. However, there is a however, if the Census Bureau does release the data sooner than anticipated, then we must make every effort possible to expedite our process uh, in advance of the new deadlines. So uh, that's great news for us because we were concerned about meeting the constitutional requirements um, with the US Census Bureau releasing the data so late. But this is great, this gives us time to do a thoughtful process and draw really you know, a good product. So commissioners, any discussion on this or questions before we move on to the next item? Okay, uh, with that, I'll move on to agenda item five. So this is the item deliberation and decision-making on the draft 2021 rules of the reapportionment commission recommended by the rules permitted interaction group we discussed these rules um, at the last um, meeting. And I know in particular, I had a couple of questions that were answered to my satisfaction. Um, and we had some good discussion about that. Included in today's meeting packet is a draft of the rules of the 2021 Reapportionment Commission. An initial draft was presented uh, at our last meeting on July 6th. The rules in today's meeting packet were updated to include the technical and non-substantive changes that were discussed at that meeting. Do the commissioners now at this time have any proposed amendments or comments in addition to those? Okay, as there is no further discussion, is there a motion to adopt the rules of the 2021 Reapportionment Commission that are in the meeting packet? So moved. Make a motion. Okay, so I heard Robin and Dylan, uh, one moved and one second. We'll take that as a mo motion and a second. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Secretary, can you take the roll for a vote? Mr. Chair? Yes. This is Commissioner Nishimura. Uh, Hi. One of the testifiers indicated there may have been a problem with the posting date. Is have we met the statutory uh, requirements for posting? Okay, so um, is if there is a question, I, I know um, I did speak to our attorney, but I wanna make sure that we give the opportunity of every commissioner to feel comfortable uh, whether or not they've spoken. So is there a motion for the commission to convene an executive session to consult with the attorney on the questions uh, uh, pertaining to the commission power, duties, privileges, immunities, liabilities, pursuant to HRS section 92.5A4 regarding the draft rules of the reapportionment commission. I so move. Second. I second. Okay, so I think there was a motion by Grant and a second by Randall. Um, any further discussion on that motion? All in favor of moving into executive session, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so public, uh, we indulge your patience as we're going to go into executive session to confer with our attorney uh, about the questions that were raised in public testimony. Um, thank you. Mr. Secretary, can you ask your staff to put us into executive session? You're doing it right now. Okay, thanks.
Hey, Scott, Mr. Secretary, can you tell me when all the commissioners are back in the open room? Scott, are you back? Yes, I'm confirming everybody is back. Okay, great, thanks. Don't see Commissioner Chip Chase, hold on. Okay, everybody is here. Great, thank you to the public. Thank you for your patience as we conferred with our attorney and executive session. Um, in so doing, the commissioners are confident that we are following both the spirit and the letter of the law in um, moving to act on the, of the rules today. Uh, first of all, in terms of the spirit of the law, uh, these rules were posted as of May 17th. And except for a couple of cleanup typos, um, uh, we, we are going to be uh, moving and potentially acting on the same set of rules. Secondly, in terms of the letter of the law, uh, the posting deadline is for six days to post the agenda ahead of the meeting, uh, which we did. For all meeting materials, the statutory requirement is that the public um, gets the materials posted at the same time that the commissioners receive them. And in fact, that was the case done here. Um, uh, Commissioner uh, Scott Nagos, Election Officer Nagos office sent the packet of meeting materials to the commissioners at the same time it was released to the public. So, um, the commissioners were confident after conferring with your attorneys that we are meeting the spirit and the letter of the law. So with that, um, turn back to the business at hand, which is um, taking a look at our, the rules as they are proposed. And is there any further discussion uh, on these uh, posted rules? As there is no further discussion, is there a motion to adopt the rules of the 2021 Reapportionment Commission that are in the meeting packet? I think we made a motion and there was a second. So that was under discussion from Commissioner Nishimura. Yeah. So, okay. Go back and vote. Chair, the, the motion was Commissioner Nilonaka, seconded by Commissioner Kennedy. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Kennedy. Okay. So, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, Secretary, will you please take the vote? Commissioner Chip Chase? Aye. Commissioner Chun? Aye. Commissioner Kennedy? Aye. Commissioner Nakota? Aye. Commissioner Nishimura? Commissioner Nishimura? Sorry, was on mute. Aye. Commissioner Nonaka? Aye. Commissioner Ono? Aye. Commissioner Rathbun? Aye. Chair Muguishi? Aye. Chair, the motion passes. Thank you. Uh, uh, with that, I will move on to the next and final, I think, agenda item. Um, which is the continued presentation of by our staff for the reapportionment commission staff. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to David Rosenbrock uh, to continue what he had started the last time and educate us on what they will be doing. Mahalo, David. Aloha commissioners, I'm David Rosenbrock. I would like to reintroduce Royce Jones who is responsible for providing reapportionment, redistricting, mapping, and GIS support services <clears throat> to the commission. We both have worked with the public providing access to the same information and mapping resources that you as commissioners will have access to. In 2021, the commission and the public will have access to online redistric redistricting resources using an application developed by the mapping software company, ESRI. 
Today, Royce and I will be providing an overview of the two-step process of reapportionment and redistricting in Hawaii. We'll also cover some additional topics. We begin with what is reapportionment and redistricting? Why is it done and who does it? Then we will talk about the US census population data, how it's reported and when we expect delivery. And when will it be available to the commission and the public? We will explain the Hawaii constitution's requirement in determining two separate population bases. We will then provide information on redistricting guidelines that should be followed when drawing district boundaries. We will conclude with a brief description of the ESRI redistricting online software application. Any questions? I'll now turn it over to Royce Jones. All right. Thank you, David. Aloha, commissioners, members of the public. Uh, we do have some topics to go over here. Uh, introduction, reapportionment, redistricting in Hawaii, what it's all about. So uh, I'll move through the slides here. What it's about at the core is equal representation, both at the federal level, and that's the US House of Representatives, equal representation as called for in the US Constitution, and at the state level in the state Senate and the state house as called for in the Hawaii state constitution. So what does this mean? To, to provide equal representation, there's really two steps. The first step is reapportionment, determining how many seats each area gets. At the federal level, that's 50 states, 435 seats in the US House. How are those apportioned among the 50 states? It's based on the census on the population. Um, and then at the state level, we have four basic island units. You can see them there on the right-hand side of my screen, Hawaii, Maui, Kauai and Oahu. So for our state Senate and state house, we apportion those seats among those four basic island units. So similar to the way the US house is amongst 50 states, ours are apportioned among four basic island units and they're all done the same way. It's a method known as the method of equal proportions. And that is called for uh, in the constitution. So the reapportionment says how many seats, then we need to actually draw the districts with balanced population. So that's the second step, the redistricting step. You can see I've outlined here what that is, both at the federal level um, and at the state level. Uh, several things to do there. I'll go over them each uh, in a moment. But the end result, what we're trying for is equal representation. So who does all these things, all right? A lot of steps here. Well, the apportionment of the 435 seats among the 50 states is done by the US Census. Everything else here is the responsibility of the commission, the advisory councils, and the input from the public. So there's a lot of work to do here. We're gonna get into a little more detail about them. Um, where is all this coming from? State constitution article four on reapportionment. Uh, some of you have probably looked at that already. That's what calls for this commission to draw districts with balanced population for the US House of Representatives. That's section nine. Then apportionment within those basic island units. Again, you look, section four has that wording. It calls for the apportionment among the four basic island units. It lists them just as I've listed them on my slides based on the total number of permanent residents in each basic island unit. And it does mention the method known as equal proportions. Once we know how many seats each basic island unit gets, then comes time to draw districts with balanced population. And again, section six of the Hawaii constitution specifies how that's to be done such that the average number of permanent residents in each district is nearly equal to the average for the entire basic island unit. As practicable, we'll talk about that word in a moment. And on the Senate, there's an additional section because our state Senate usually has four year terms, but because of redistricting, they all got two year terms. So to minimize the impact of multiple elections on the, the resident population of each district, 
uh, there is a call for the commission to assign two-year terms to 12 Senate seats and the other 13 get four-year terms. Um, and this is based on that resident population within each of the new districts. So we do have this information about the elections in the past uh, so that we can assist the commission in making this determination. So who's actually doing this in 2021? Well, that's also called for in the Hawaii Constitution. I think you all know this by now. Um, because you are appointed by the President's Senate, minority leader, Speaker of the House, House Minority Leader, and then the eight of you chose your ninth member, the Chair, uh, Mark. And likewise, as called for in the Constitution, each of the basic island units has four members. They have an advisory council with four members each. You can see the names up here on the screen um, of those advisory council members that the, the commission can call on for input. So with that, that was a quick introduction to reapportion, redistricting. We're doing it for equal representation. It's called for in the US and the Hawaii Constitution. Uh, any questions from the commissioners before I move on to the next topic? Okay, hearing none, census data. This is the big question on everyone's mind. We've heard about delays in census data. Well, what is the census data? Uh, what do we know about it? Well. It started in 1790 after the constitution uh, was adopted and required uh, equal representation. So the first census in 1790 and it's been done every 10 years since. Uh, I just put in a few numbers of what the total uh, US population was in each of those years. So there it is in 2020, uh, 331 million, 449, 281. The census themselves, the census data is used in a number of different ways and reported in a number of different ways. You can see here, each of these different uh, boxes are different ways that this census data is reported and used by various government and non-governmental agencies. Um, you may have heard a couple of different dates for when census data is going to be released. You may have heard end of September that's when this entire, all of this information will get released in, in, in a format for people to use. For our purposes, we really only need these two green boxes. We need the state level, which actually has been released, and we need the census blocks, the lowest level, and I'll talk about those in a minute. For our purposes, we just really need these two, and that's where they'll actually be available in August. Uh, earlier. We don't have to wait for the final one in September. Uh, and I'll talk more about that timeline here. But these are the only two of all the different things census does. This is what we need. And indeed, the US Census uh, has released statewide population totals. Those came out on April 26th. And that's when the US Census then did the apportionment and Hawaii maintained its two seats in the US House mm -hmm. of Representatives, which will then be a uh, responsibility of the commission to draw those districts, those two districts with balanced population. The census blocks themselves, there's what they call a legacy format that will be released in mid-August of 2021. So about a month from now, we expect to receive this data and it's in this quote legacy format, uh, which they have published and we are prepared to use. So we do not need to wait until the end of September uh, we are prepared as soon as census releases this legacy format data in mid-August to read in our census block population data um, and start working with it. But what are census blocks? Well, in Hawaii, there are 14,732 census blocks. They're outlined in purple here. Um, they include the Northwest Hawaiian Islands and um, areas offshore, but most of them are like you would think of a city block. Most of them are bounded by streets. In fact, in Hawaii, over 80% of those census block boundaries do follow streets. You can see on the left uh, is an area in Honolulu and each of those purple outlines is a census block. And it's just like you think of a city block. In other areas, you can see on the right-hand side, the area in Hilo, 
Again, most of them just look like you'd think of a, a city block, you know, a block surrounded by streets with people living on the block. But there are some areas, uh, the Hilo Municipal Golf Course, you can see there's a boundary there that kind of wavers. That's a stream that cuts through the middle of the golf course. Some of our census block boundaries do follow other features like streams or sometimes ridge lines, uh, particularly up in the more uh, Malka areas, you get some very interesting shaped uh, census blocks. Uh, but nonetheless, every area within the state does have a census block. Um, and every one of those, the census will be reporting, again, in mid-August in the legacy format, what's called the PL94171 resident population data. So each one of those 14,000 census blocks, we will be given a number of the resident population as of April 1st, 2020. Some of them will be zero, particularly those offshore ones. Uh, some of them will be in the tens and hundreds. A few of them in the more dense areas could have uh, several thousand people within a single census block. Um, but that is the number that gets reported that we need for our reapportionment and redistricting purposes is that census block information. So as I mentioned, we expect that in mid-August in the legacy format, and we are prepared to work with that. So what happens then? So in mid-August, we get that census block data, at which point uh, the commission will want to redraw the district boundaries with balanced population, right? Census Bureau has already gone and said, okay, you have two seats, they've apportioned it. But this commission does have the responsibility to then draw the boundaries of those districts. So we're ready to support that. As soon as we get that block level data from the census, um, we're prepared to process that data, get it to ESRI, to ESRI, to load into the online redistricting application. And once that's up, the commission and the public will be able to begin redistricting using the same tool set, using the same data. Uh, we anticipate September 1st, 2021. So given that the data comes out mid-August, we get it processed, we get it to ESRI, they get it loaded, we should be ready to actually start drawing plans September 1st. That was the federal side. The state side, there's a few additional steps because uh, as you might recall, I said the words permanent resident population that is called for reapportionment within our state Senate and state house is to be used in total number of permanent residents. Likewise, redistricting in section six uh, calls for the commission to use the number of permanent residents. So, we're uh, better prepared to do this. And the Office of Elections has been working closely with both the military and the universities last year because we need these numbers as of April 1st, 2020. Right? The census numbers are as of April 1st, 2020. We need these same numbers from the military and from the universities as of April 1st, 2020. So the Office of Elections uh, has worked with them. We have those numbers and that's the numbers you see up on your screen, both the total statewide and by basic island unit. Um, I did put just a map in since as you saw, most of them are on Oahu. Um, these are the areas where most of the extractions will take place. And perhaps not surprisingly, they're focused around the military bases and the universities. So we are prepared to do this as soon as that census data comes out. Uh, within a day or two, we should be able to have these extractions complete. And at that point, if you want to do redistricting and take your turns, okay, so here's the extra steps. Just like on the federal side, we'll process that PL94171 data. Then we will extract the non-permanent military and students, which gives us then the total um, permanent resident population for each basic island unit, which allows us to apportion seats. Again, this is nothing the commission needs to decide. It's the method of equal proportions. Once we know the numbers, we will know how many seats each basic island unit gets. We'll pass that information on to Esri 
to load into the online redistricting application. And then the commission and the public, just like the federal level, will be able to have the same data, the same tools, begin redistricting. Uh, and again, we anticipate September 1st, 2021 um, to be able to do that. Um, we heard the date of late February to get all of this done. That's all these steps I mentioned, plus a lot of additional steps, right? Because September 1st, hopefully we can start, but then the technical committee or permitted interaction group works on proposed plans. Those plans get presented to the full. And I've, I've, I've shortened out, there's plenty more steps, but just to, to reinforce it, there's several more uh, steps along the way. Uh, the commission will finally adopt a plan which starts the 20 day notification period. Uh, then the public hearings after those 20 days, uh, re any revisions, final adoptions, and the commission files the plan by the chief elections officer. Uh, we heard the date, February 27th is the absolute last date. Uh, if it can be done sooner, that would be great. If the census data comes out sooner, we are prepared to move on it and get it processed sooner. Because this is a commission's responsibility ends here, but we're not ready to do an election yet because there's a process called reprecincting and there's a process to where the county clerks of both the Big Island and Honolulu have to draw their council boundaries. So similar to this commission drawing the US House, State Senate and State House, we do have commissions both on the County of Hawaii and the city and county of Honolulu who will be drawing council district boundaries. Once all those district boundaries have been created, at that point, each of our county clerks can assign all registered voters to their new districts because you need to know, right? Here's the new districts, who lives in which district, which ballot will they get? And at that point, the Office of Elections will need to create the new precincts for managing the elections and reporting results. So there's a number of steps oh. after February 27th. Uh, we look forward to helping you get all this done in time. And we will be continuing supporting uh, the clerks in the Office of Elections to carry this process through and be prepared for the 2022 uh, elections and candidate filing actually, which starts well before the election. So um, that gives you a little more information on the census data and when we expect it. Any questions from the commissioners on that? On the data itself, on the timelines? Hearing none, all right. There are a number of guidelines for redistricting. Um, I've summarized them here with some, some sample maps. Uh, one of them is that the districts should be compact. And compact can uh, be looked at a couple different ways. The simplest is geometrically compact. Does it look like you know, a square or a circle, something uh, compact geometrically? In this case, it does. In this case, you can see, yeah, it's starting to kind of look a little bit not so compact. In fact, it's starting to look a little bit like this. You've probably heard the term gerrymander. There was the map of the original gerrymander. It starts to look like you might be favoring a person or a political party, which isn't allowed. So we aim for geometrically compact, but also geographically compact geographically compact, this district, which again, I've just made this up for illustration purposes, District 1 looks compact geometrically, but those of you who know the geography on Oahu realize that the Ko'olaus divide that in two, and those are two very different geographic areas on each side of, of, of that ridgeline. So this would not be considered a compact um, district. There's another uh, guideline that the districts be contiguous, not disconnected. So here, this is an example of one that is disconnected. That would not be acceptable. Even one point connections um, are to be avoided. And then the other thing is submergence. We wanna to try to preserve socioeconomic communities wherever possible. In fact, that's the words I mentioned before, where practicable because all of these are guidelines. You didn't see any hard and fast numbers there, although you can put numbers behind some of these things, but they're really, if, if 
the plan is challenged and goes before the federal court or the state court, they will be looking at these types of things, compactness, contiguous, submergence, and determining um, the, the validity of the plan. There are some specific numbers though, and that is the deviation of population. I mentioned balancing the population within the two districts for the US House. They need to be balanced so that there's less than 1% difference. This is a court accepted deviation. So we do know our total state population that I mentioned was released uh, back in April by the census. So we know our ideal target population, if we hit it exactly 50-50, each one of our districts would have 727,636 people. Realistically, given the census blocks that you need to draw boundaries around, it's not gonna be exactly 50-50, but they need to be within 1% of each other. And actually, ideally, I think it's like 0.87%. Um, but we will, in the online application, you can monitor what that number is. And I'll show you that later as I'm talking about the application. Uh, you can see as you're creating a plan, uh, what is the deviation uh, within the plan that you have. So the 1% deviation, that's for federal. For our state Senate and state house, it's a 10% deviation within each basic island unit. Um, I gave you the numbers for the federal. I cannot give you these yet because as I mentioned before, it relies on the census blocks. We don't have that information till mid-August, but we are prepared as soon as that information comes out in the legacy format. Within a day or two, we should have the total numbers so we can using the method of equal proportions, apportion the number of seats for the state Senate and state house within each of the basic island units. And then we will know the ideal target population. Until that time, until we get that census information, we don't know. Uh, extract the non-permanent residents, then we'll be able to give you these numbers. But as I said, we should know within a couple of days um, of the release of the census. We're prepared to do that. And as I mentioned, the online application from Esri does have a number of these checks. So um, as you're developing plans, as you're looking at plans, as members of the public are developing plans, we encourage you all to run these tests. Uh, in fact, I think a lot of that was in the rules. As I look through the rules, I'll make sure you run these integrity compactness tests that I mentioned. They're there, they're supported, uh, use them. Any questions on those guidelines from the commissioners? Okay, hearing none, just briefly, the online application itself, um, it's similar. If you did the online application that we used 10 years ago, uh, the new one has similar tools. Uh, it's just slightly different. It's more modernized, it's more up-to-date. It, it does have a few more tools that we didn't have available to us. Um, there is a learn tab and there'll be a set of, of learning exercises. Uh, we'll be working with you on that uh, to learn what it's all about. You can create districts, you can move census blocks, assign census blocks to different districts. I should mention that. I guess I didn't say that on my map. When you're assigning census blocks, they are the lowest level block. So you're gonna assign a census block to either district one or district two, not part of a block, the entire block, right? And so that's what this tool will allow you to do. Say, okay, take this block, put it in district one. Take this block, put it in district two. Or outline 10 blocks and put them all in a district. It's got a lot of tools to help you do that efficiently, but it does work at the block level. Um, you can create plans if you want. We'll have several uh, template plans ready to go. And of course, as I mentioned already, review the plans, compactness, integrity, other things. You can generate various different reports. You can export the data. Uh, there are other applications that people like to use. You can export the data uh, and, and consume it in other applications. And this is true, the commissioners and the members of the public, everyone has access to all these same tools. And then I should mention, there is the submit tab because members of the public can submit plans directly to the commission. So they've used the same tool, they've created a plan, uh, they can submit that plan to the commission. 
And we had this 10 years ago and, and I can tell you, I was there, plans were submitted, they were reviewed, uh, lines were changed by the commission based on this public input. It does make a difference. Uh, so I encourage members of the public to please do use these same tools because uh, it really helps the commission um, if you can provide that information in this format. So um, that's kind of a quick summary of all these. I think David has an update for us on the Esri online redistricting. And if there's any other questions from the commissioners, he can take that. David, are you there? I'm still here. Thank you, Royce. On July 12th, the reapportionment project office met with ESRI to discuss its ongoing preparations to service the reapportionment commission. Specifically, ESRI plans to stand up its online redistricting application by the beginning of August and to load it with the 2010 census data. On July 15th, we received notice that the software had been released to us. We expect to complete configuring the software and loading the data by August 1st. We plan to begin training the technical permitted interaction group on using the software as soon as possible after that date. The actual 2020 data is expected, or the 2021 data is expected on August 16th. ESRI expects to have it loaded by the beginning of September. This should give the technical permitted interaction group approximately a month to familiarize itself with the application before beginning with the 2020 census data. We'll keep the reapportionment commission up to date on future development and the scheduling matters. That's all I've got. Any questions? David and Royce, mahalo for your presentation. It's very informative. Uh, one, one request, if possible, um, during your training period for the permitted interaction group on the technical group, um, I think it would be helpful to offer that same training to the commissioners who are not on that as well, so they can follow along and play with the tool as it's going on. So the more familiar I think everybody, all, every commissioner is with it, uh, the more input, uh, educated input they will have once we start approving plans. So if you could just factor that into your scheduling um, timeline. Certainly. Thank you. Commissioners, before we adjourn, is there any question for either David or Royce? Yes. Uh, uh, in the uh, marketing session of efficiency, if we could find out when these trainings uh, we're basically less than two weeks out now. If they're going to start on the first, if we could get a heads up so we can plan accordingly to be, uh, I, I personally want to attend as much as possible because I wasn't around in 2010. So uh, if that's possible, I'd really like to get to that on the calendar. Yeah, that sounds great. So David and uh, Scott, can you take care of getting that on people's calendars? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mahalo. Anything else from the commissioners? Sure. I have a quick question. So based on Royce's explanation of having public input, I'm just trying to understand the protocol. So we have the commission, then we have an advisory committee, which is our people that were appointed on each island. And then now there's an opportunity for people that aren't appointed in that committee or the commission members to also have input. Is that correct? Yes. So are the individual people that aren't appointed to a committee or a commission, so are, is there protocol for them? Should they be sending their proposed plans to the advisory committee that then presents it to the commission based on you know, their island specifically, or how is that gonna work? Well, in the past, after we get a submitted plan, we take the submitted plan to the technical permitted interaction committee and share that with them. And then we kind of go from, from there. Now, sometimes the folks will share their plan with the advisory council and then the advisory council bring it up to the commission. So there's any numbers of ways. We, we wanna make it available for everybody that wants to participate 
to be able to participate. Right. I just didn't know if there was any protocol for people that are not on a committee or commission <clears throat> where they're supposed to submit their plans to. It goes, it goes right into the database. So as soon as they submit the plan, it's uh, submitted to the commission. Okay, so, so the entire commission. Pop yeah. up here, Robin. Um, there is this submit plan. So they've developed a plan, a uh, member of the public, right? Anyone can, uh, they get a login, they can submit this plan to the commission. And, and as David mentioned, so uh, it was actually my job 10 years ago to take these <laughs> plans and then present, you know, here's what this plan says and here's what's different than your plan. It was a lot of work. We did that in the technical committee, the technical permitted interaction group uh, 10 years ago. Probably that's where it'll happen here also because it's it's that kind of level of, of, of detail. Um, and we don't know how many we'll get, but I, I can tell you last time, everyone we got, I summarized, presented to the group and, and definitely um, it, it was valuable input, so. Great. Thank you. You bet. All right, thanks. Um, we are over time. And um, if there is no further business, is there a motion to adjourn? So move, Mr. Chair. Second. Second, yeah. Okay, we have a motion made by Commissioner Chan. Was it Commissioner Chan? I believe it's Nishimura. Commissioner. Oh, Nishimura, okay. And then you have the second, Scott? I believe it was Commissioner Onaka. Okay, terrific. Um, all in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, mahalo. Thank you very much for the presentation from the staff. It was great. Uh, we'll see you all at the next commission meeting. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks all. Thanks.